For this episode of Coffee with Closers, I'm sitting down with Sam Baylor, the CEO of Boost Point. Boost Point is on a mission to help organizations build strong brands by attracting better talent. Stay tuned for my conversation with Sam where he shares practical advice for entrepreneurs and business leaders on marketing, sales, strategic decision making, and customer success. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey, Sam, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. Thanks so much for having me, Samuel. Appreciate it. Most certainly, every entrepreneur has a journey of how they overcame obstacles to become an opt- entrepreneur. I'm sure, I'm sure you have some similar story to share. Can you share with our audience a little bit about your journey of becoming an entrepreneur? What led you to start your own company? 100%, yeah. So my, my entrepreneurial story, um, I feel it's maybe a little bit uh, maybe unlike some others. Like it, I didn't necessarily have this dream as I was a kid to run a company. You know, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs, they're 10, 12 years old and they're like, you know, um, starting a micro company and things like that. I never necessarily had that dream kind of growing up in high school and things like that. Um, but however, I, I definitely grew up in that environment. My dad's an entrepreneur. He started several companies. Um, and so I was very used to the environment and I had the privilege to, to work for my dad in several of those companies. So I always had the mindset of like, company ownership like as an employee even though i didn't actually like own or run the company because it was a family business there's just kind of a sense of ownership to it and so i feel like that just kind of got me used to that whole idea of like that sense of ownership and putting in that type of energy and effort into a business and so <clears throat> i had the opportunity to especially like kind of grow up in in my dad's most recent company which is equipter it's a manufacturing uh, company. He invented this piece of equipment uh, for the roofing industry. Um, and as as I was coming in, out of high school summers and stuff working there, I saw the opportunity to just kind of jump in head first into that company. Started um, at a young age, like my 18 years, started like doing sales, <clears throat> sales at that company part time, eventually full time, and then had the opportunity to become uh, establish the marketing team there. So I, I was in those years, I was just kind of taking every opportunity and saying yes to it. Cause I didn't really find, I wasn't exactly sure where my tactical passion was. Like, is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it finance? Like I wasn't really sure. So I just like tried a lot of different things. And then, um, once I started, um, just getting a little more interested in marketing and playing that role, um, that's really where I found my passion. And, and so that's really what I dug into there. And so I had the opportunity to become the marketing director there, build a marketing team. And I mean, long story short, kind of in, in the span of like three years, we like quadrupled the company. Um, and so it some really steep growth a lot on the backs of what we were doing in marketing. We had a great product, a great sales process. It's just we we didn't understand like how to get in front of our audience. And when we figured that out, things just scaled. Um, and so it was, that was, that was a really fun experience <clears throat> just kind of being involved in, in growing that company. Um, and then, then I started getting a little itchy with like, Hey, what, what, what would it look like maybe starting my own thing? <laughs> um, and, mm-hmm. um, it just became, you know, I started listening to other podcasts and things like that and really got interested in the, uh, the SaaS model, B2B SaaS model, very different than manufacturing. Um, but it was something that I, I just, there was a lot that attracted me to the B2B SaaS model. Um, and then mm-hmm. after just kind of chewing on, on that idea for a while, there, there was an idea of a product of like what that could actually look like and a vehicle for that. Um, teamed up with my co-founder and built an MVP, launched it and started getting customers. And that was about three years ago since we launched Boost Point. Um, and right now, three years later, we're, we're growing, building a team. And um, yeah, that's kind of the short, short story there. <laughs> Yeah, and I was looking at the Equipter, which is a pretty uh, amazing technology, by the way. Uh, you know, I'm sure your dad probably was in the in the roofing industry and saw the need for doing all the cleanup after a, a roofing project is done, right? You dump all the garbage down, and then by end of the day, now you got a big cleanup job to do. I've seen they just put tarps. That was like the old way, right? They will leave tarps, and then they roll up the tarps yep. and try to get it off the 
the the pro property owner's um, <laughs> property. But it seems like a pretty innovative way to cap catch the the, the waste and uh, and easily transport it uh, without having to do a lot of you know man man hours doing all that cleanup work. Yeah, uh, pretty pretty interesting concept. Yeah, the roofing industry that was like uh, I mean twenty years ago when when my dad came up with the the idea for that product. I mean the construction industry as a whole tends to be maybe a little behind on technology and things like that. Um, and there just was not a solution to like my, my dad owned a roofing company at the time. So he experienced kind of the pain of that every day. And I feel like that's where a lot of like your great ideas come from is just someone experiencing that problem day in, day out, and actually finally coming to the point of like, let's solve this problem. Um, and that's what he did. He bootstrapped that company, um, but ha had an idea and, and really went for it, was willing to take the risk. And um, now it's a, a nationally branded company. I mean, Tesla, they own Equipters, the biggest roofing companies in America. Um, it's a, mm. it's a, it's a great company and a huge, huge footprint now. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is to build a product, you know, a company, right, especially with a manufacturing backbone and actually bring to market a product, right. Which has the intellectual property, right. Getting those things right. Then the design then the pro prototyping, then manufacturing, like you said, marketing it, getting the awareness for the product, then actually get customers probably even having to do financing because I'm assuming it's not a small purchase. Yep. All of those is not an easy, easy business to start. So kudos to your dad and your family for having successfully launched and, and grown that company. So where did the idea for Boost Point come about? Because obviously this is a very uniquely positioned product, um, mostly you know geared toward companies that are actively growing and recruiting people, right? So where did that, um, I'm assuming there was some pain that led you to even having an idea for a product, you know, a software like this. Yeah, there was. So um, I, again, rewind, you know, three and a half, four years ago when, when kind of this idea was brewing. So I, th my context again back then and who I rub shoulders with every day was the construction industry. And a pain point that I saw there for small businesses period was the, the barrier to adopt newer advertising uh, strategies and methods. And one of those was social media advertising, um, especially in the home improvement industry. And, and what I saw there is like, all right, everybody agrees that they need to be adopting newer methods of advertising, you know, switching from uh, traditional media like billboards and TV ads and radio ads, uh, yellow pages, things like that, to newer forms of advertising like Facebook ads, Instagram ads, YouTube ads. Um, like, again, rewinding five years ago, like everybody like would acknowledge that, but the barrier was they just didn't understand how like a lot of these companies they maybe didn't have the internal experts to figure that out or the budget to go to a large marketing agency to kind of figure it out for them so they were just kind of stuck in this um <clears throat> outdated version of marketing and advertising and so it was actually from mm -hmm. that context that the idea of boost point came came about was hey let's build a a SaaS product that does all the heavy lifting of launching successful social media ads um hyper-targeted ads like takes care of all the targeting the content creation and actually like produce helps them produce um R roi positive ads without having like a background in social media advertising so where our platform would do the heavy lifting of of giving them the the channel to be successful with these newer forms uh, of of advertising and so that was the idea originally and so we built that product um and we're seeing good growth in the home improvement industry of our product being a customer acquisition tool um for like roofing companies construction companies and then we started um and in the startup phase you know your first year or two you're you're building a product you're putting it out there and you're experimenting a lot and that was one thing we were very open-minded with like, Hey, let's put a product out there. We know what we know, but there's a lot that we don't know as well. And let's be willing to learn from our customers. And then one thing we started seeing about a year and a half ago is a lot of our customers started using our platform for a recruiting solution, especially, I mean, COVID kind of accelerated this, but I mean, right now a lot of industries are in a hiring crisis. Um, which is not, I mean, like first time in history that like the U S there's more like open jobs than there are people in on unemployment. And so this is just like a massive 
problem like as a whole. And then we started seeing our customers utilize our platform for a recruiting solution. Um, and so we started listening to that, listen to our customers and how our customers are using our product. And we um, soon saw that this is the future of Boost Point. Um, so uh, this year we, we made a, a shift in, in our, our go-to-market strategy and we positioned ourselves as a, a recruiting tool uh, first and foremost versus a customer acquisition tool. Um, and that's where we've seen you know a lot of our growth here this year after we made that transition and also like a lot of different industries now that that applies to than just the construction industry. I mean like the the healthcare industry, senior care industry, um, manufacturing industry, all customers of ours kind of since we made that shift. So is it mostly just a SaaS or do you have a SaaS plus service model or, or do you just provide the customer, uh, customer success team for them to adapt the product and then they're on their own to go and implement it? Yeah, so it's most, mostly a, a SaaS model um, with customer support um, and onboarding support. Um, but the reality, so stepping back a little bit, it, it, you look at, again, the, the recruiting problems right now, like organizations, like especially high volume recruiting, like manufacturing companies, food service, senior care agencies, um, just like high volume hiring, like they go to Indeed, you know, Zip Recruiter, and pretty soon just like they reach a cap as far as applicant flow, like, like there's just not enough of people searching for jobs um, for them to fulfill their empty positions. And so, but then you have, um, some data like 83% of the job market is actually a passive job seekers. Um, so they're not actively searching on Indeed and ZipRecruiter and these platforms. Well, the reality, the most affordable place to advertise and get your open job positions in front of these uh, passive job seekers is social media advertising. And so that's what our platform gives organizations access to is a recruiting team, a recruiter who has no experience with social media ads, they can, you know, within 10 minutes, upload a very high performing social media ad that's um, providing two to three times more applicant flow with the same invest mm -hmm. investment as what they'd be putting in like Indeed. Mm -hmm. So I understand maybe like, uh, you know, skilled workers and things like that, blue collar workers, probably there are very powerful way to reach them. Have you seen success? Let's say if you are looking for you know, someone who's in a professional role, um, maybe hiring for, I don't know, I'm just saying like a marketing agency trying to hire or a CPA firm trying to hire or any of those organizations uh, want to also hyper target. Is the, is the, does your platform allow for people to be able to target based on their skills or is just mostly based on geographic? From what I was able to gather, I, I see you're able to target based on geography and things of that nature, but are there, are there other ways of uh, targeting the, the possible candidates? Yeah, so we 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 do for for each like industry that we um, that we kind of plant a flag in, um, we do a lot of industry research as far as like the tar targeting criteria of specific positions and how to get in front of that audience, you know, on platforms like Facebook and Instagram, um, and so there's there's quite a bit of. Uh, of you know ways that you can kind of narrow that down to um, target a specific person. Um, I will say like our, our the majority of our customers are you know um, maybe unskilled nursing or you know uh, manufacturing companies that need a workforce for their uh, manufacturing facilities. So uh, again, a little bit more high volume hiring. With that said, we do have customers that you know have success with more of your um, specific positions, you know, with specific mm -hmm. skill sets, you know, sales professionals um, and, you know, uh, other types of positions as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit, obviously, you know, you've built this company, you've been running for, you know, more than three and a half years, you've had, you know, great success. Um, and now you've made a pivot, right? So I'm assuming you're learning in the process, right? Who's your ideal customers? And like you said, you had a MVP, you had success, you had paying customers, then you naturally adapted the product to fit the market need as opposed to just trying to fit the people into your product, right? So I'm assuming there's a lot of learning that's happening in the process. So tell me a little bit about some of the big lessons you learned in the process of building the company. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the big things that, that I've learned is, um, 
you have to listen very closely to your customers. Like you have these assumptions as a founder of what the market needs. And you usually have to like jump in and experiment with some of those, but you have to be willing to listen to how people respond to that um, and make decisions based on that data, not ver versus just, you know, um, a hundred percent going on your uh, assumptions, you know, and you have to be willing to um, make a shift if it requires a shift or, um, you know, understand again, what, what your customers are saying and what your user base is saying and, and be willing to make decisions based off of that versus of just what you feel as a founder. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know you, you bring up a good point. I think there's this in the SaaS world, right? This whole concept of product market fit, which you know everyone talks about it. But I think you know I just recently listened to another interview where they were talking about the whole concept of product market fit assumes that you're going to make the market fit into your product, uh, right? right? When you talk about listening, listening to your customer, oftentimes that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to try to bring the customer fit into your product. You really have to figure out what the real need in the marketplace is and see how your product can meet that need as opposed to, you know, to try to fit them into a specific product you created. Um, that's a good point. And you talk, touched on decision making. Talk to me a little bit about decision making, right? Especially as you're a growing company, there's a lot of big decisions to be made, uh, right? Probably hiring, product, you know, product uh, roadmap, maybe even markets that you're going to go into. You just touched on the whole concept of how you pivoted as a company in terms of who you who you are becoming, right? As a company, there's a lot of big decisions to be made. Some are very, very strategic decisions. So is there like a framework that you follow in terms of how you go about making decisions? Yeah, for, for there, there's kind of two things that, that come to mind with that question. Um, one is like, if you have data, like try to make as, as much database decisions as possible. Um, so for us, like with, uh, you know, the shift we made as far as the type of market we're going after, that was, um, you know, a lot based off of looking at our customer cohorts and seeing the SaaS metrics kind of behind those. And that really helped validate the decision that we really felt was right. Um, so again, we had this assumption and we're like, hey, like, uh, do we make this leap or not? But was looking at the data of kind of comparing that, that confirmed um, confirm that decision. So really, again, make, make as much like database decisions as possible versus just feeling based decisions, mm -hmm. um, is very important. Um, the second thing is, I, I, I feel like, um, us as founders, sometimes we, we have, um, we, we can come up with, with these assumptions that, that like, how do we know they're valid or not? And one thing that I think it was part of like, I, again, I spent three years in just hardcore sales, like at my dad's company when I was like 18, 19, 20, it was um, like just legit sales, cold calling roofers, telling them about this equipment. And then um, naturally I'm a pretty like extreme introvert actually, but that kind of helped me get, get outside of my box and like just learn how to communicate, talk with people and things like that. Um, and it was, so that, that was a great, like looking back, it was a great learning experience, like for tools that I can use now. But again, that's really helped me in, in just kind of breaking the ice, even with our customers. It's like, Hey, like if I feel like, like our customers need something instead of like, Hey, let's build this out and spend two months building out a new feature. Let's me, let me actually like jump on a zoom call with five, 10 of our customers and talk to them about it first, before we spend any resources to actually build something new. Um, and just, I mean, it's kind of a practical thing, but it's like, there's so much value out of just getting in front of your customers, actually having real conversations with them as found as a founder, um, and, and just putting in that energy. I mean, one story, one, one, one podcast that really kind of launched me into, um, starting this company here is the masters of scale podcast by Reed Hoffman. I, I love kind of the stories there. And like one story that always stuck with me was the early days of Airbnb and the founders there of how they, they did things that wouldn't necessarily scale, but it was what enabled them to build a product that people actually use. I mean, they'd literally go in person to their, to, to, to properties that were listed on their platform and they'd take pictures, uh, you know, for their, the profiles and stuff. But what that created was they actually had real conversations with their customers 
And based on that feedback, they were able to build a platform that was better than any other platform. Yeah, I think Reed kind of talks about the whole concept in his uh, blitz scaling book as well. Doing yeah. the things that are not scalable until you figure out, you know, what really is, you know, need to do to, to scale. Um, I, yeah, I do love Reed and his philosophy on business and marketing and all of those things and do enjoy some of those podcasts as well. Um, and I think when you touched on this whole concept of introvert, I can relate to that as well. You know, all through high school and college, I was such an introvert, never enjoyed group projects, always wanted to work by myself. No, and, I hated it. You know, yep, here me. you are, <laughs> fell in the sales role and had to learn to get out of that, that comfort zone and really having to learn to relate to people and communicate and do all those things. So yeah, I think life has a way of putting you in places that you, <laughs> you had no interest in getting into. Um, so obviously you touched on really getting to know the customer and then understanding their need and then you know taking decisions based on actual data as opposed to emotions and feelings. So it brings me to a question, right? It's, it all comes down in the business world is all about execution, right? We can all have ideas. We all have you know tons and tons of ideas, but execution is really what pays the bill. So what are some specific practical things that you do in terms of getting things done, right? Whether as a company or even individually you know, as a leader, right? Getting, getting things done. It starts, it starts with this. It starts with having the guts to do it mm -hmm. and just like getting used to that place of vulnerability, you might say. Um, like I'm not, I've learned like, I, I don't, when we know we need to make a decision, we, we make it and we don't delay. Um, and that's one thing I, I feel like growing up in an entrepreneurial environment, like I saw, well, this is one thing that, that, that like, I, I, I think about fairly often is like uh, rewinding 15 years ago, um, like seeing like the equipter company and my dad making that leap. Like it was risky. He risked his whole prior business and his prior success on this new venture. So it was a big leap. Um, and, but he had this idea and he acted on it. I wish I'd have a dime for like, so I used to go all these industry trade shows. I wish I'd have a dime for the roofers that came up to him and said, Oh, like I had this idea five years ago or like, Oh, like that's so cool. Like I thought of this, like there were so many people that had an idea, maybe similar like that, but nobody had the guts to actually make the mm -hmm. decision and like risk it. Um, and I feel like just having having that innate ability to be able to like make decisions even though they're risky. And I feel like that's really helped me even here at Boost Point leading the team here is taking those leaps when you know it's the right thing and being willing to take those risks. It can, um, that's where you can see that big reward. Yeah, most certainly. And I think, you know, in the beginning I was saying how, you know, it's one thing to build a SaaS company and I'm not minimizing whatsoever what it takes to actually build a SaaS company, right? Because, you know, you can go to market very quickly, you can have a prototype, you can have things in place, but it's not the same actually building a product, right? You building an actual physical product, you have to have a concept, an idea, you got to go find, you know, file patents, get, you know, get funding to actually go create a prototype and then you got to make the prototype to actually work and then you got to find customers who are willing to give you money to go and make this and then and then really have to go <laughs> turn it into a business. So I think that that's just takes a lot of guts uh, to be able to do that, right? It's extremely uh, more difficult. And I think the biggest problem with the SaaS companies is you can definitely get to a product very quickly, but then, you know, depending on how you price the product, it all comes down to the volume of a, a customers that you're acquiring and doing it at, uh, you know, at a, at a sustainable cost of acquisition and then being able to retain the customers, you know, because you're, you got such a sticky product that people adapt it so well, yep. right? And then they stick with it, right? That lifetime value increases where that's where the SaaS company has to do a great job, right? It's not, you know, you can get an engineer as a co-founder you know, co and build a product and probably have something up in two months, but that really doesn't make a SaaS company, right? That's just an idea <laughs> on a web app. Yep, so yeah, yeah, I think you're, that, you're, that's one thing. Like to, to your point there, that's one thing that again, SaaS was new to me. Like I was, I was used to you know the, the 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 professional like the, the services model with like construction and roofing, and then the manufacturing model, and then jumping into a new model of SaaS. I had to be willing to kind of relearn all that, that stuff. Like what are the important metrics and like, but that's really helped me. And again, being guided by 
making decisions based on metrics, not just feelings, like being able to jump into, you know, our profit wall account and seeing, Hey, where are the opportunities for growth? You know, is it uh, lifetime value? Is it our retention and things like that? And then making decisions based off of that for, you know, features you add to your product. It's not just like, Oh, nice things to have because, you know, you know, three customers said that this would be cool to have. It's like, okay, but what metric will this affect? And does it align with with our mission and where we're wanting to take the company? Yeah, and I think the, the you know the grass is always greener on the other side, right? Someone who's on the you know like building a product company is like, oh, I want to go build a SaaS, but not you know only after you build a SaaS company do you really realize you know what it takes to build a, a successful SaaS company. Obviously, you know you mentioned about you know you know the, making decisions, and I think a company's really comes down to the leadership and and how you manage it. So, what are some things you've done as the founder to build the right team members and and create the leadership that's needed, and also what is kind of your leadership style in terms of managing and running the company? Hundred percent. That's like um, when I really dig down to like that's a big big motivator for me and a big part of my why. As far as like why I wanted to start a company and run a company was to be able to be in the place to be able to build a team, um, and and do that well. So that's definitely like I look through that lens a lot through a founder versus just you know sales or marketing or product. I think about through the lens of like building our team, um, and that's mm -hmm. a huge core component to um, like my style. Um, and a few things there that, 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 that I've seen is like, it's important to understand like what you want your culture to be and define that as a founder, but you need to hire the people that connect with that. Um, and instead of just hiring anybody into the company and then like training them into your culture, it's like, they kind of already need to innately have that. Um, and so hiring kind of from a culture perspective, not just a skills perspective, um, is really big. And then for me, a big one too is just always keeping like understanding what, what your team members, what are their personal goals and mission, like what's their mission and how can they align that like within your company versus them just, you know, feeling like they're, they're working to produce someone else's dream. It's like finding out what are their dreams and what are their motivations and how they can actively like live that out within our company and help achieve that has been really big as well. And it and really helps like as contribute to our our culture here to where they really feel like they're, you know, building on 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 their dreams and like their mission as an individual. Um, versus just contributing to, to someone else's. Yeah, that's a great point because I think if you, I don't know who actually mentioned this, it could be a Zig Ziglar story or something. You, you give, uh, you help people get what they want and they will help you get what you want or something, right? I think it could be a Zig Ziglar. Um, so the same concept, right? You understand the, the dream of that employee and help them get that dream, whether it be buying a home or whatever, right? So get them that dream and then they will, they will, you know, help you build a company that you're dreaming to build, which is a, it's a great concept. And what, one thing I've realized too is like each person, I mean, we're, we're all wired differently and to be able to help like your team discover that as well. Cause a lot of people like evolve in their career within a company. Like they, maybe they, they, they come out of college thinking they want to do one thing particularly, and maybe that changes and just again, giving them the guidance and the, the freedom to kind of figure that out um, and help them along with that journey. And again, from that perspective of like, Hey, each individual is wired differently. And like, so, you know, it, it's not like a copy paste type of roles, you know, in our company, like, again, we have defined roles, you know, account executives, customer success and things like that. But it's like, Hey, we have frameworks of how like you can, um, you can, you can, uh, you can achieve that position successfully, but within your own style, because you are wired uniquely and, and differently than everybody else. So it's like, Hey, here's this framework of how you can be successful in this role, but giving people freedom to, to work in it, their own style. Most certainly. I know you mentioned earlier, you know, how you were uh, taking a lead role in sales and also kind of adapted in, you know, took on the marketing responsibility at your dad's company. 
and now you're building a company and you're, you know, in, you're helping other companies do their marketing and customer acquisition in the early days and now you've kind of, you know, turned the product around. So how has your approach on sales and marketing evolved over these years? Yeah. Um, one thing I always like to, like, simplify it. Like one thing, like if I rewind, you know, eight, nine years ago, um, one of the questions I was trying to answer um, back then, and this is a lot of still the framework that I think about with sales and marketing, is because um, every wine back then, you know, at Equipters, like we didn't have a huge marketing and advertising budget. We couldn't hire a big PR agency or marketing agency or, you know, spend um, 50 grand on this huge marketing campaign. So it was like just this, this question that I was trying to answer is like, where can I get in front of the most people with the least amount of money? And like, how can I get my message across like in that way? And the answer to that back then was, uh, was Facebook ads. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what, like, if, if I'm completely honest, like it, that three year span that we saw a ton of growth, a lot of that was on the backs of, of Facebook ads. And back then mm -hmm. it was not the conventional way that you marketed and advertised a, a manufacturing company. Like it was back then it was just like, I mean, it was, you barely had like a business Facebook page. It was just like the early days of like creating a business Facebook page and like starting to advertise and things like that. And if you did advertise, it was more of like a, a B2C type of <clears throat> type of thing and not a whole lot of B2B. But like when we started experimenting, we just saw it's like, Hey, this is the most affordable way to get in front of our target audience. When we, when we kind of compare it to, you know, magazine ads or direct mail or trade shows. And like, we still did some of those traditional things, but once we started seeing like, Hey, the payoff is just a lot greater. We spend less money here, get in front of more people. Um, and so the ROI was higher, you know, just having the mindset of like always trying to iterate to find what that thing is and really lean into mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and I think you mentioned earlier like the manufacturing companies are late adapters. They're they're not usually the ones to lead the way in anything. And I think, you know, a lot of times by the time they adapt something, it's already kind of too late and overplayed. Um, so I think that that's tend to happen in the manufacturing sector. Yeah, don't get stuck. Like don't get stuck in just the, the norm. Even like, you know, B2B SaaS is like, "All right, there's kind of standard ways of doing things." And it's like, yeah, lean into those things, but always have, you know, that 10, 20% of your energy, like trying, working on new things, you know, um, things that are a little bit outside of the conventional box and being willing to, uh, to, to find those things. You know, one interesting thing that I, I want to say about that is usually it comes from the leadership too, because if the leadership can give the freedom for employees, you know, below them, right. The, the subordinates below them to give them that flexibility, and the and the autonomy to go take chances on things like your dad trusted you to go and test facebook ads to say hey well if you want to do it go go try it and see if we can reach our roofers right and i think that's the the big thing because a lot of times i've seen you know especially having conversation with marketing leaders they say oh no we'll, we'll never do that in our company oh we'll never try that at our company well, that you're either you just don't have the guts to go tell the leadership and say, hey, I understand that you don't think this is going to work, but I can assure you if we tested it this way, this is the kind of outcome we can expect, right? Give me 90 days to prove myself wrong. And then if I, I'll never bring another bad idea again, right? And I think right. the leadership mm -hmm. giving the, 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 the team members, not necessarily call them subordinates, but the team, team right? The opportunity to go test new things. Um, but yeah, I'm you, a you do huge make advocate for that. I'm a huge advocate for, for that. Like a, as a leader, you have to be willing to delegate responsibility. Like responsibility is power. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to give away as a founder or as, as a leader. Um, but you have to be willing to give away some of that responsibility so that your team can ha be creative. They can, um, because Again, so much can come from like we don't have all the answers. That's another thing I really realized in three years that I've been running Boostpoint is like personally, like I am not the best at everything at this company, like for sure, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, and I've had a lot of the initiatives, you know, to 
you know, to, to build our sales team, to build our marketing team. And like, I've been the head of a lot of those initiatives. Like a lot of early founders are, you just got to spearhead it, but you bring other people into those roles and then you let them give them the responsibility to do it better than you ever could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think giving them the autonomy to take decisions and then sometimes live with the consequence of that decision, but give them that autonomy. And that's how new innovations and new ideas will always come to front. But if they're all waiting for you to give them the ideas, then why do you even need them in the first place? Exactly. Uh, right? exactly. So that's so true. So obviously as entrepreneurs, right, the one thing we don't have enough of is time. So I'm <laughs> just curious to learn what kind of productivity hacks that you have uh, to kind of uh, stretch the time and uh, get things done. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good one. Um, I, if I'm completely honest, this is not one of my strengths. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like, but I have found ways to be intentional that can help me like get things done in a bit more efficient manage efficient manner. And one of that is, is time chunking. Like that's one of the practical things that's like, Hey, I'm, you know, I take an afternoon and I, and even though maybe I don't have meetings scheduled that full afternoon, you know, put it in the calendar of like, this is what I'm going to work on. This is what I'm going to work on. And, and, you know, um, just kind of helps you knock down your, your task list, you know, when you really need to get stuff done. Um, at the same time, I will say as well, like I, I do, I do think it's important sometimes to give ourselves the flexibility, um, to think creatively. So sometimes I've found, my most creative ideas are when I'm not bound to specific time frames. I'm kind of in that mode right now, like at the end of the year here, actually, where I've, 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 I've tried to clear my task list a little bit, you know, earlier in the month. Um, I'm trying not to like create a ton of meetings because I know this time specifically is I need to get more in the mindset of strategic thinking and things like that. So it's not so much as like, hey, how can I be as productive as possible? Um, and I think that's really important for us to understand and realize like what is the importance um, and what's the priority at certain time frames. Like sometimes it is, hey, you need to get as much done as possible in a short amount of period um, and be willing to be disciplined <laughs> and plan your days out accordingly. Um, but like, you don't want to live in that as a CEO or as a founder, you do not want to live in that tactical, uh, place all the time because you need to be giving insight and leadership from a visionary perspective and to be able to like understand that vision, build that vision and, and communicate that to your whole team. And sometimes like that happens. Most times that happens when you're not necessarily bound by specific timeframes and you just kind of give your free, give yourself the freedom to think creatively. Most certainly. Any parting wisdom for our audience? Yeah, I, I think so. I think of, you know, the, the audience here, you know, probably a lot of entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs may be thinking about um, some of these ideas. Um, at the end of the day, like if you find that this is a part of your personal mission, that you want to do this, take the leap sooner than later. Um, cause it's only going to get harder as, as the years go on. Um, and I remember that again, like four, four years ago or so, you know, was when I was really ingesting a lot of different like audiobooks and podcasts and stuff like that. And a lot of ideas were, were, were churning. Um, I land, I had to actually land on an idea and have the guts to like go act on it and be willing to take that risk. Um, and, but you really need to understand, or you, you really need to be willing to commit to that because, um, something I've, I've, you know, heard even before, you know, started the business here is like, you know, starting a business is always 10 times harder than you initially maybe think it is. And I was like, all right, that's interesting. I heard that from a lot of founders and pretty much everyone like had that mentality. I'm like, all right, that's interesting. And so I kind of went in with that mindset, but I didn't really know, you know, we have our spreadsheets and how we think it's going to go. It's going to go differently. And most likely it will be harder than you anticipated, but you need to be willing to commit to it um, and have the endurance to see it through, even if things get hard. Hmm. Well, a great way to end our conversation here, Sam, and I certainly appreciate your time and thank you for sparing this afternoon with me. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. 
This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.